myself, um, Andreas, uh, we've got Stefano sitting here as well, and James, our final speaker. We are very passionate JavaScript developers and very passionate functional programmers. Um, and we wanted to do a talk about functional programming, but one of the issues that we often find is that it's really hard to cover an entire programming paradigm in 20 minutes. Um, and it's hard to sort of give people an idea of why you would want to adopt this. Um, so what we did instead was we strong-armed Elnott to um, let us book the whole night out and do three successive talks um, about functional programming where we sort of layer a little bit on top every time. Uh, so I'll start by talking a little bit about the fundamentals. What is it? Uh, some of the basic tools we use to sort of program in this paradigm. Then Stefano will um, talk about how we can use some of the functional programming uh, patterns and some of the, the tricks from functional programming to solve some of the more common uh, problems we have in especially JavaScript programming. Uh, and finally, James will show us how we put all these things together and build a, a microservice in a completely functional style um, that will power our, as we call it, Talk Finder 2000. Um, which is a search service for uh, LNUC Talks. Um, as I said, we're all JavaScript developers, and none of us actually come from a functional programming language. We both tried them out, but we're, we're original JavaScript developers. So it's, for us, it was more of a how do we make JavaScript work in this way rather than sort of trying to adapt it to a language we already knew. Um, and what I want to ask you to do is slightly suspend disbelief if you're not familiar with functional programming. It can initially sound really weird and seem very counterintuitive, but as we build things on top of it, there's some things that will start to unlock and we'll start to see how actually quite a lot of benefits can come out of coding this way. Um, so I want to start with a quote I really like. Um, it's, from John, um, it's from John Carmack, who is the head developer on uh, ID software. And if you don't know who he is, you've not played Commander Keen, um, which is by far the best game. He also made Doom and Quake and these things, but he made Commander Keen. So here's a man who knows what he's talking about. Um, so in the first talk, we've got a three-step plan for learning what functional programming is. First of all, we're going to figure out basically what's, what are we talking about. Then we're going to spend some time building up a shiny toolbox of functions and tools we can use to build applications with. And finally, we're going to try to apply that to some more real-world scenarios. Um, to start out very basic, um, just before we go on, we're using ES6 syntax for our uh, code. We can't expect you to know most of that. If there's anything specific where you just think that looks completely weird, just let us know and, and like, we'll explain it right away. Um, so right here we see a function. Um, and as functional programming kind of states, it's really about programming with functions. But more precisely, it's about putting functions front and center and making functions be the very core of how you build your applications. So we want to take functions and we want to combine them, we want to extend them, we want to build them in a way so we keep expanding our application. Um, one of the things that's distinct from many other ways of programming is that there's a strict separation between what's a function and what is data. And in object-oriented programming, uh, data and functions live together on objects. In functional, they're kept apart. Um, so in this case, when we're calling add, we say uh, we apply the function add to the arguments one and two. That's just terminology. Um, which is quite distinct, different from calling a method an object. We're passing in the data, we're getting out a result. Um, the second thing we've done here is we've added what's called a type annotation. And this one is stolen from Haskell, so we just added them as a comma, uh, as a comment. And what's the, what the one at the top says is that the function add takes a number and another number and then returns a number. So in this case, the Thin error is just, you know, type annotation for fat error. Um, and of course, three here is just the type number. And the reason why we want to talk about this, the reason why we want to bring in types is because they add a lot of information about the data we're working with. And 
there's a lot, we have a tendency in JavaScript world to sort of ignore the fact that there are types because it's very loosely typed. We don't really have to talk about it. We don't really like talking about it. Because when we say type, we think, oh, type errors or Java compiler or something like that. Um, and in the reality is that types are present everywhere. They're part of programming whether we want to or not. Uh, a loosely typed language doesn't mean you don't have to deal with types. It just means that you have to deal with them rather than a compiler. It means that eventually you will have to resolve it. Even if right now you don't have to think of it, eventually you will have to think about it. Um, so we start out with a very useful tool uh, called Compose. Now what Compose does is it takes a bunch of functions and then returns a function that will call them one at a time from right to the left. And it'll pass the data into the first one, then the result of that will go into the next one, result goes into the next, and so on and so forth. We've got an example here of, of get URL query, which takes the first function that splits the string by a, a question mark, and then takes that result, which is an array of two strings, and turns it into the function last, and last just returns the last element array. So in this case, we created this little simple function in one line that just gets the query part of a URL string. Um, we can add a few more um, functions here. Merge, the first one, is just a shorthand for an object assign that doesn't change any of the objects. So it does the same as normal object assign, but we're just not actually changing any of the originals. We're keeping them intact. Uh, from pairs is a very useful way of taking a list of key value pairs uh, in an array and then returning an object based on this with the keys and values. Um, and finally, in this case, split pairs just take a list of strings and splits each of them by equal sign. Now, once we have all these, we can then compose all these into our parse query function um, by calling them one at a time. We start by splitting into an array of key value pairs as strings. We split each of those strings into the key value pairs and finally pass that into our from pairs function that joins it all into our object. We start out with a string, we end up with an object, and we can do it all in a nice little line here. And one of the things that are interesting to see here is that a lot of these are not really sort of domain-specific functions. Merge, for example, is not really, doesn't know anything about it's a URL. It doesn't even know it's, has no idea what's, what's, what's it's being used for other than joining um, objects. And the same is true for from pairs. Uh, and that means we're extremely reusable in our code because it doesn't have to be used for URL parsing. It can be used anywhere. Um, the next function we want to add is called curry. It's a little bit complicated, so you don't have to actually read it. I just put it up there for good measure. What it does is it takes a function and returns a new version of that that allows you to apply the arguments one at a time. So as an example, we can take split which is basically just our string split operation. But if we call it with a separate and a string, so a two argument function, and then call that, we can then partially apply this function in this case. And what we do is we get back a function that already has the first argument applied. So this one is just waiting for us to give it a string so it can call the original function. And in this case, we get our little me and you variable that's just a list of the strings me and you. So this sort of lets us use functions to create other functions by giving them some of the arguments they expect. And this is very useful because one of the problems with our compose is that, well, functions can only return one argument. So if we're going to compose them, they can also only accept one. And we can use curry to get around that. So once we start currying our multivariate argument functions, we can start sort of creating new functions very simply based on the original ones. Uh, these should all be fairly familiar. Uh, map and reduce are quite common functions. Split, as you saw, we just defined. Uh, and because we queried our reduce function, and because we ordered the arguments the way we do, we can actually partially apply that to, in this case, a essentially reversed merge that just merged the previous accumulator, as it's called, in a reduce function with a key value pair and an empty initial object, and we can actually build our from pairs function just by passing two of the arguments to reduce. So the function from pairs just got a lot simpler because we can just, it's just partially applying it to reduce. Um, 
And of course, our, our parse query function, we can rewrite again, much, much simpler now, uh, because we don't have to extract and create all these specific functions. We can just partially apply existing functions. So we partially apply split to create the first function that splits by the ampersand. We then partially apply the map function. So we get a function that expects a list, which is what we get from split. And of course, in this case, the function we map over is splitting by the equal signs. Finally, we pass that into our old friend from pairs, and we build up an object based on this. So in a very single line, we now get to pass a URL query. And I don't know if any of you have written those, or come even better come across them in old code bases. They never look like this. They're never one line, and they're never particularly simple to uh, keep track of. And another very interesting thing to note here is that the only function that has anything to do with queries or parsing queries is the last one. All of the other ones are generic functions, they're, and they're all in functional programming libraries. So I just define them for, for, for ease, but we don't ever write these. We just get them from a library or define this. So extremely reusable code because, as you said, well, the only bit we needed to do was this combination of functions. Now, this sort of changes, when we look at all this, it kind of changes the way we see functions. Um, usually, we're used to seeing it as a collection of statements to be executed, uh, which is true in, in most of the JavaScript we write every day. Um, but in functional programming, it's actually slightly different. We start to see functions as a relation between an input value and an output value. Um, we, get, we put something in, we get something out. And more specific one input value and one output value. Because once we query a function, what we've actually done is we've taken a function that took multiple arguments and created one that takes just one. Now the return value, for example, if it takes two arguments originally, the return value is another function. But that's a perfectly valid thing to return from a function in JavaScript. So we create functions that they only take one argument. And the reason why we pass them into query is just because sometimes you want to apply them to two. So it gets a little bit easier rather than to having to call them one at a time. We can just give them multiple. So it's sort of a short end. It becomes a bit the normal way of calling functions kind of becomes syntactic sugar in this way of thinking. Um, the other thing that we want to make sure is that our functions are stateless. And what that means is we want to make sure that every time we call a function with a given uh, argument, it has to return the same thing every time. Because once we start composing and building things on top of each other and making or building things more complex, we have to be able to reason about the lower levels of our functions, the, low, the smallest bits of our components. And consistency is the most important part of this. So we want to say them, make them stateless. And of course, the, other th and the final thing we need to consider is that we can't have them go and do all sorts of other things. They can return a value, and that's it. Because if we start having them call uh, APIs and various things, then what used to just be a little utility, a reusable utility, now can have effects you can't quite consider or reason about in this context. So we want to keep this very sort of very minimal in what functions do. We keep them very simple because that allows us to reuse them in ways we otherwise really couldn't. And of course, the final thing that's really important here is that functions are very composable. And that means we create more complicated uh, functions and finally applications by composing them of smaller bits. Every step is a combination of previous steps. And therefore, every bit is very, we can drill down and find exactly what we're looking for. It's easy to find because we can walk down our, our little um, function tree to find exactly what we're looking for. Um, so now that we've built a little bit of a library, now that we've got an idea of what it means to code in a functional way, let's take some examples of how we can use this. So um, I'm going to introduce two more uh, generic functions. The first one's called prop. Initially, it seems very, very useless, because all it does is access a property in an object. And that you can actually write in less code by just accessing the property of the object. But because we can curry it, it gives us some, some, some fantastic power. Uh, the second thing we do is we take sum. And again, we can use our reduce function, partially apply it. So in this case, we use add, which just adds the two number and a zero. And then reduce become a sum function. Because if you give it a list of numbers, it'll accumulate over the total by adding the values together in each step and return the sum of the list of values. 
Um, and even though normally a reduced function doesn't actually take up much space, it's very rare you see that they can be written this short and this concise. Um, and the final thing is we want to build, in this case, a hypothetical function called uh, total price. And what it does is it takes a list of items from an imaginary shopping bag and returns the total price of those. And the way we reason about composition in functional programming is we think about the types of data we have. So in this case, we know we need to get a total. We know we want sum in there somewhere. And we know in order to use sum, we need to get a list of numbers. So our challenge is not to find the total. It's actually now, how do I find a list of numbers? And we do, well, we, we know where we get the number for. That's the price property on our item. And we know how to get the price property. We partially apply property. And then we use map to basically translate that function from one that takes it from a single object into one that works on lists. So when we partially apply map, what we're actually doing is we're translating a single function on a single element into a lists function that operates on lists. Um, we can do this even further. We can say, let's introduce filter. I'm sure most of you have seen before as well. And um, we can compose that on, uh, on the back of it. So say, well, what if we start by filtering all the, only the things that are in stock? And then we get the total of items in stock. And every single step, we get to reuse what we've done before because we keep it very clean. And what do we want this function to do? It only does that, has no side effects. I mean, we can constantly reuse them in new ways. Um, a final example I want to show is a little bit more complicated. Um, just, just a little. Um, and we are going to use it later. So it's, sort of a, it's, it's a bit to help James out in his talk. Um, we start out with the first index by, and what that does is basically you take a list of objects and you give it a function that creates an index. So you see our function, uh, if we look in the type signature, the first argument for the function is something that goes from A, could be anything, to a string. We then get a list of A's, again, right now we don't know what they are because this function doesn't really care what they are. And then finally we return an object with string parameters and a. So in this case, we create a function that defines how to build an index. We give it a list of something, and then essentially we get a list, that, uh, an indexed map out. So rather than going through the function, uh, the list to do a lookup, we can now do an index lookup and a hash map. Um, our inner join function does exactly what inner joins do in uh, MySQL, or any SQL really. Uh, you give it a key for the first collection, a key for the second collection, and then returns the first collection where all the elements from the second one has been added in in place of the key property on the first one. And we do that by creating first a lookup table of the rightmost, the Ys in this case we call them, lookup table of the first one, and then we map over and add that in to the elements in the left one. And the reason, that what, what this lets us do is that if we now go and fetch a list of talks and a list of speakers, as we do later, we can simply create a function that combines them just by partially applying this inner join function with the keys we want them to look up. So this has sort of been an introduction to sort of the, the simple things we do in functional programming. It's a bit of a, <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, and as I said in the, in, the, in the start, we want to slightly suspend disbelief. Some of this can seem a little bit strange, but as we start building things up, it becomes familiar, and then it becomes very simple. Um, <laughs> I guess you're going to have to trust us a little while for that one. Um, yes. Uh,